a potentially haunted Romanian RPK coming up. What is up guys, my name is John with pewpewtactical.com, your definitive source for gun reviews, gear guides, and all things that go bang. As we've mentioned before, we're pretty big fans of military surplus blasters or guns that just have interesting histories behind them. And considering that we got some pretty decent feedback on our sort of lore heavy P1 video, we decided to take another look at a piece of Cold War tech that also has an interesting story behind it, especially considering the relative rarity of the gun itself. A good friend of the channel recently threw down the cash for a Romanian RPK being sold through Atlantic Firearms, and we knew that we'd have to bribe him to let us play with it once it arrived, as the guns aren't super common in California, let alone the US, and they generally sell out quite quickly once they're in stock. So some history to give you a little bit of context regarding the original Soviet RPK before we dive into the nitty gritty details of this gun in particular. It's the early 1960s, and the Soviet military is looking to standardize their small arms and infantry weapons as most militaries of the time were. The concept of the squad automatic weapon is a relatively new one. Although arguably guns like the Madsen were the first to be employed in this role, most fully automatic support style weapons were still chambered in full size rifle cartridges and required one or more assistant gunners to be utilized effectively. The American BAR is another step in a similar direction, although notably it was still limited to 20 round box magazines and obviously was still chambered in 30 6 the point being that many modern militaries began to understand the importance of having a highly mobile source of automatic fire integrated into infantry squads and fire teams. Fast forward to late World War II and firearms designer Vasily Degtyaryov had finalized plans for the Rushnoi Pilomyot Degtyaryova, or Degtyaryov's light machine gun, the Soviet RPD. Designed to replace the DP-28, the Soviet RPD was one of the world's first belt-fed machine guns chambered in an intermediate rifle cartridge, utilizing the same 7.62x39 round as the AK-47, essentially making it a precursor to the modern squad automatic weapon. The RPD saw substantial use throughout the Cold War's numerous proxy fights, but it was eventually replaced during a bid for parts and training standardization by Kalashnikov's RPK during the early 1960s. The RPK itself is essentially a beefed up AKM, introducing a thicker receiver and heavier barrel to stand up to sustained automatic fire, and ditching the underbarrel cleaning rod for a deployable bipod as well. The RPK utilized the same bolt and bolt carrier found on all AK series rifles, as well as the familiar fire controls located on the right side of the receiver. The RPK also ditched the RPD's belt-fed system and introduced longer 40-round magazines or 75-round drums, meaning that the gun could be fed from the rest of the squad's normal AK magazines if needs be. So where does that leave our Romanian blaster? As a former Soviet satellite state, Romanian arms manufacturer Fabrica de Armeco Gear produced RPK clones locally known as the MD-64, based off of the original Soviet specs. Atlantic's RPK is assembled by M13 Industries and is built on hand-selected MD-64 parts kits, utilizing entirely original Romanian-made parts mated with a US-made Childers Guns receiver, Green Mountain chrome-lined RPK barrel, and ALG fire control group. The gun is billed as a battlefield pickup, which essentially means that the American-made parts have been artificially weathered to match the aesthetic of the original Romanian parts, and honestly, they did a great job. The gun looks great. Slightly anachronistically, the gun also includes a dovetail optics rail mounted on the left side of the receiver and an AKM-style slant muzzle brake. Because Soviet arms designations are a Kafka-esque nightmare, this would technically make the gun an RPK-L, wherein the L suffix denotes that this dovetail rail was specifically meant for the NSP-3 night vision optic that the gun would have been issued with. The dovetail will fit most standard optics mounts meant to attach to the side of an AK, such as this Midwest Industries mount that we've got here, but it will also work with purpose-built Russian-made optics like the PSO or Cobra red dot sights as well. Firing the RPK is an absolute blast. Although the gun is obviously devised as a support weapon and ours is locked to semi-automatic, burning through a mag on a long boy with a bipod still gives us that distinctive warm and fuzzy feeling. While quite simple, the bipod does its job admirably. When not in use, it locks in place underneath the barrel via a small locking latch. 
To deploy it, you release the latch and let the springs do their magic, opening the bipod legs enough to allow them to swivel forward and lock into place beneath the front sight block. You've got a tiny bit of traverse here, but the bipod itself doesn't really have any kind of swivel functionality, so you're gonna have to pick up the gun and physically move it to engage different targets laterally. The sights themselves are what you would expect from an AK patterned rifle, with the notable addition on the RPKs of a knob that controls windage. Why the Soviets thought it necessary to include a knob that adjusts windage on a gun that is meant for saturation and suppressing fire, we're not sure, but it's neat. Our particular RPK is comprised of matching 1965 dated stamps throughout, which is neat knowing that this rifle and all of its part kit components have lived together in one iteration or another for 50 some odd years. The wood featured on the handguards in stock are beautifully stained and full of patina and character. A particular aesthetic gripe of ours is the weird blonde and deep red stains we see on a lot of American-made AKs, whereas the actual comblock stuff tends to be much less flashy, especially when it's been beat to shit through years of use. One slightly disconcerting part of the handguards here, uh, we notice that there are several what appear to be notches cut into the right side of the upper handguard. You can draw your own conclusions as to what that might mean. It might be more innocuous and totally unrelated to creepy kill counts, but given that the only time the Romanian military would have used this in anger would have been to put down the Romanian revolution that happened in December of 1989 and Yikes. The gun's got the iconic RPK clubfoot stock in the rear as well, which includes a steel butt plate with a compartment for stowing a cleaning kit. The stock is obviously designed to maximize stability when shooting from the prone. And as is common with a lot of Soviet weaponry from the era, feels absolutely odd when trying to fire while standing with anything close to a modern grip. The gun sort of feels very similar to an SKS in that regard if you've ever fired one, whereas the length of pull on the stock feels really short compared to the overall length of the gun, especially if you're used to ARs or adjustability or the groundbreaking Western concept known as comfort. Obviously, the RPK has an absolutely enormous barrel, and as such, the center of gravity is actually going to be pretty far forward of the handguard, so it does feel a little bit wonky to fire from the shoulder, but again, it's a support weapon, it's not really designed for that. A fun thing to note is that the Romanian RPK is actually one of the only RPK clones that shares the original specifications with the Soviet RPK, meaning that if for whatever reason you wanted to drop accessories on here that are meant specifically for RPK series rifles, you should have no problem doing so with the Romi RPK. Compared to the Serbian and Yugo like M72s, uh, things like the stock trunnion are just gonna be completely different. So for whatever reason you wanted to trick this thing out, you can. While we didn't bother shooting groups with what's essentially a civilian version of a support weapon, anecdotal evidence suggests that shooting from the bipod does indeed affect your point of impact as it's mounted directly to the barrel itself. Again, maybe something to be aware of if you're at all concerned about accuracy, but we weren't. This is a fun range toy to burn mags through, not a precision weapon. The trigger itself is pretty decent and has relatively minimal creep and take up before breaking. Another thing that is pretty cool is that Atlantic is totally willing to ship these to California as long as you purchase a grip fin kit alongside it during checkout, which is gonna make the gun featureless. However, compared to an AR where a grip fin really doesn't feel that different once you sort of get acclimated to it, grip fins on AKs can feel downright odd, and it's going to change the angle that your finger is actually engaging the trigger at if you're following proper shooting technique. It doesn't really lessen the fun of shooting this thing too much, but it is something to be aware of all the same. Again, the Romanian RPK is just another super cool piece of history if you are at all into Cold War guns or comblock stuff, and I definitely am. At about 1350 when they're in stock, you'll have to decide if this collector's piece is worth the wallet pain yourself. But considering Soviet-made RPKs are essentially unobtainium, this is likely going to be your best bet if you're trying to snag something closely related to one of the world's first magazine-fed squad automatic weapons. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching. If you are enjoying us stepping a little bit further into the world of historical guns, let us know in the comment section below because we really enjoy producing this content. Also subscribe to the channel. Once again, my name is John with PP Tactical and we will see you next time.